The title of this episode today is Could the U.S. Win a War with Iran? That doesn't mean what it may seem on the surface of it, like if the balance of power between what it was and if they were fighting, could they win? The question really is, could even should the U.S. fight a war and under any definition, could they win a war? And by the in my definition is, could the end result be a better United States, a safer United States and, and a, a better security environment than the one that exists right now? And now I think you'll probably know that my answer is conclusively no. Uh, there is no scenario by whereby we would end up better on the backside of a war with Iran. So most assuredly, we should not choose one. And I'm going to prove that to you today or give you some pretty compelling evidence to, uh, to make it so. And I'm also going to show you some of the, the logic behind some of those that are advoca advocating enthusiastically for war with Iran, how they are absolutely on thin ice and how much harm it would do to us if they get their way. So without any further ado, let's jump right into it. And we have an, uh, back again, one of our favorite uh, guests, Mike Domino, one, one of my fellow uh, colleagues at Defense Priorities, uh, and also a former CIA officer, uh, and somebody who has his finger all on this pulse here and is tracking this stuff really close. Really grateful to have you back today, Mike. Thanks, Danny. It's always great to be back with you. We got a lot to, a lot to talk about today, a lot to get into. We do, and and, and I want, we're going to cut through a lot of this nonsense that that uh, a lot of the mainstream media are having because you know they'll have these these well known names of people on that uh, that make lots of claims that as you're going to see in some of the clips we'll play here momentarily they're almost never challenged and so we're going to provide that information uh, this public service is what we're doing here so that you can see that some of this stuff is nonsense no matter what kind of pedigree. The person saying this may have. Uh, and so let's jump right into the first one here. So uh, in, in this was actually just before Israel and uh, before Iran launched its uh, its retaliation against Israel for the uh, April 1st uh, embassy bombing, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But uh, right before this, Pompeo was talking about some of the things that are involved in what the U.S. should do. Uh, and, and this actually takes uh, is, is currently available e even after the strike has happened. So here's what he said. Can't at every turn be talking about the fact that you're fearful of escalation. When you when you begin to talk about, well, we're not going to do anything to the Iranians. We're out of this game. Uh, they view that as a green light. And so you're right. Continued aggression. Think about the fact that we've told Israel, hey, you have to be way more careful when, in fact, we know the Israelis are fighting in a way that is as careful as combat can be conducted. Those are the kind of things that uh, the perception from the Iranians grows, that they can move about the cabin freely, and the risk to the United States continues to increase as well. Okay, let's let's kind of let's kind of take apart some of that stuff. He said that the risk to the U.S. would increase consistent considerably if we don't take action. That Iran can move around the cabin freely right now because they're uh, basically they just don't believe anything that we say. And Israel is the most careful army on the planet in taking care of civilians. You can take those in whatever order you want. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the big point that I would start with, Danny, is this idea that, um, again, escalating further here with Iran somehow uh, makes the U.S. safer or allows us to, um, you know, have a, a security environment in the Middle East where our interests are less threatened. I think the big issue right now is with 30,000 troops in the Middle East, U.S. troops, and with the number of different security commitments in the region um, that span a number of issues, whatever happens next here up at the escalation ladder is going to impact the United States. And that's why I think it's responsible for the U.S. to go ahead and prioritize a more uh, muted response as far as what the Israelis may do. I think they will go ahead and respond to what we've seen happen. But I don't think the United States should join them in doing that. And President Biden, who I've been very critical of many times, you know, has made that clear. And I give him credit for that. And every U.S. president, Danny, for the past 40 years, when the chips are on the table with Iran, has made the decision, has made the calculation that going forward with a full-scale war with Iran is just not in U.S. interest. And I like the way that you defined, you know, sort of victory conditions at the beginning of the show, right? I mean, the United States is a nuclear power. We're a hegemon, of course, you know, in some kind of crazy, you know, all-out scenario, yeah, you, we could defeat. Uh, Iran in a war. But again, would that cost global nuclear war as a result? Is that really worth it? Or even in, you know, even in lesser scenarios there, if thousands of American troops are killed in the Levant or uh, 
in the Persian Gulf? Is that worth it? Is that a victory? Um, and for the people like Pompeo that are advocating for regime change, I would just say as, as a former intelligence professional, that's a lot harder to do than it may seem. And the results are not always uh, you know, in control. I, I remember, I, I'm, as I'm sure you do, Danny, hearing all the time that there's no way anything could be worse than Saddam Hussein. And I think what we have now in Iraq is much worse than Saddam Hussein, if I'm being very honest with you. And if you look at the political science and international relations literature as well, what we know from long, you know, long look studies on these kinds of questions, uh, political change has to happen organically and it has to happen uh, naturally domestically. Foreign imposed regime change more often than not fails. Yeah. And so, again, this idea that I think Bolton and Pompeo and others have, you know, we heard this in Ukraine with Putin that they got to get rid of Putin. Again, I would present the same question. If people are worried that Iran may already have low yield nuclear devices, where are those devices going to go? Whose hands are they going to fall into? Or do, do we really want rivaling Iranian generals fighting over fissile material and creating their own countries and things like that? I mean, so this is the point that, you know, in some sense, Iran is containable. It's a problem that we have a lot of experience with, and it's it's a threat that is not a first rate threat for the United States. The Israelis may feel differently about that, but this is where U.S. and Israeli interests diverge. And we have to be OK pointing that out when that is the case. And I, again, give credit to the administration that I've been very critical of for saying to the Israelis, if you want to go forward with a response, the United States is not going to take part in uh, essentially declaring war on Iran. Yeah, that's exactly right. And and uh, we can add one more to the list here of, of people that we're talking about here. And I want to show a couple of clips in particular about Jack Keane, because he's on all this issue quite a lot. First, we're going to look at something from uh, from last January, and then we're going to look at something he said uh, about an hour and a half ago, uh, because those things tie together really well. The first one, he sounds like he's very much in agreement with Pompeo here. For the life of me, I don't know why we keep wringing our hands about the Iranians and are so feared mm. by the fact that they will escalate if we take decisive action against them. I've never seen anything quite like it, that this administration is so unwilling to confront who the major oppressor and aggressor is in the region, Iran, and the fact that they are pulling all the strings here. Because now, now I, I want to discuss something here that may make some people uncomfortable, but I think it's the truth. And since we're unintimidated and uncompromised of telling the truth and the ground truth reality, we have to address it. Now, in that clip right there, he claimed that uh, we have to do this to go. We can't be afraid of escalation. We have to go after Iran because they are the aggressor. But the only reason, the absolute proximal cause of this Iranian attack with all these 300 plus uh, drones and missiles was expressly because Israel broke international law, broke convention that nearly everybody has followed for centuries, no matter what regime they were from, of attacking an embassy. What What do you think about when you're talking about aggressor and, and what has Iran done? They've unquestionably done a lot of things. So they're, they definitely have done some terrorist activities without question. But when you're talking about things that could impact global war or regional war, then you have to take all of it into consideration, I think. Right. And leaving aside, you know, uh, you know, this kind of circular debate you can have on the embassy or the consulate. Again, to be very clear with people, this was a declared consular facility. This was an annex to a consulate building for uh, uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran. If you hit the consular annex at the U.S. Embassy in Amman, Jordan, or in other places, that would obviously be treated as an attack on U.S. soil by, by anybody. So look, Iran was always going to respond to this. And I think the fact that they telegraphed it uh, in advance, and there's been some very good reporting on you know advance notice that uh, the Turks and others in the region uh, apparently had here, uh, look, I think is sending a message that Iran wanted a calibrated response here uh, to respond to what happened, but also, uh, you know, not continue to escalate, to offer some kind of an off ramp. And I think some of the proof is in the pudding, Danny. Iran has tens of thousands of one way attack drones. They have upwards of 3,000 ballistic missiles in their arsenal. Okay. If we're going off of the New York Times reported numbers, which again, these may fluctuate, but for now, they seem to be pretty accurate. Iran went ahead and used. 185 
uh, small UAVs, 110 medium range ballistic missiles, and 36 cruise missiles in their attack. Okay, you do the math. I mean, you're talking about a infinitesimal portion of what Iran could have used if they were really seeking to conduct a, a much more significant response. And here you can see sort of what this arsenal looks like, right? Iran, uh, you know, I've made this point earlier for people that, that were confused about it. Iran does not have an ICBM uh, either. They're not able to strike Western Europe or the United States. Uh, they, you know, they have a couple of successful uh, space launch vehicles, SLV launches that show they can put things up into space. But again, getting them back down when we're talking about nuclear weapons and delivery mechanisms, that's really the key. And we haven't seen any kind of, you know, in-flight cold testing or other things that uh, uh, that indicate that you have that capability from Iran. So, uh, you know, they've used uh, a number of these systems to in the attack on Israel, some of those smaller cruise missiles, and then again, some of those Imad uh, those larger Ahmad ballistic missiles, we've seen pictures and videos of those uh, coming out uh, over the last day or so as well. So look, uh, you know, again, the point of this attack from a military perspective is to test the magazine depth of your adversary and to determine radar saturation points, right? For the Iranians to determine what the radar picture looks like when, you know, the Jordanians and the Saudis and the Israelis all, you know, spin up their air defense radars. And so, you know, there's a very that's a very small military benefit here in what I think was largely a calibrated response to offer a reprisal to what happened at the consulate, which, I, again, I think if we really believe in the rules based international order, like we always talk about, you know, that should be condemned. That that's inappropriate, like we've talked about as yeah. well. And speaking from a counterterrorism perspective, as somebody that has been on the other side of high value target strikes, the Israelis could have conducted that strike anywhere. They right. could have hit Zahedi right. on the way to the airport. They could have hit him anywhere else. Again, hey, hey before we get too far away from it, I want to go back to something you just said, uh, sure. because I, I don't think a lot of people really understand uh, maybe what, what you mean by this part here. And I think it's really important to uh, clarify here. Uh, I have seen a number of, of so-called experts laugh at Iran and say, this shows how weak they were. They don't even know how to do anything. Everything failed. Uh, they're a lot weaker than we think. I think, uh, uh, General McKinsey was one of those who said they've used most of their stuff. So they they showed how weak they really were. But you just said you think from a military perspective that it was actually designed to do more than just say, hey, we want to deescalate this. But also they're getting intelligence from it by magazine depth. I wonder if you can explain what that means. Of course. Yeah, Danny. Look, um, so on the military side, I think, right, this kind of sort of probing attack allows you to learn a little bit about how many interceptors the Israelis or the U.S. or the Jordanians are able to put into the air at a given time and to determine, again, response times sort of on their end, uh, you know, see how much ammunition, uh, you know, the Israelis either have or are willing to expend. And that, of course, can inform what we call salvo size, right? How, how big a chunk of these ballistic missiles do you send at a time? I think, again, if you're a real professional that's dealt with these issues, you know that when the Iranians were sending up salvo sizes of like 70 missiles at a time, that's just not very significant. That's not a large salvo. That is mostly determined, like we said, to probe these air defenses and get a sense of how much ammunition the Israelis have on the air defense side, how much they're willing to expend, uh, and, and sort of where sort of, again, these key sort of, you know, uh, spots are, if you will, in the tactical air picture uh, that we talk about here. So look, I think, you know, this idea, you know, everyone's trying to chalk this up as, uh, you know, it was a it was a huge win or a huge failure for either side. I think we learned a couple lessons, though. Uh, the air defense systems did function very well. There's no doubt about that. Uh, the air defense systems performed very well. Again, they had three days notice and they had a lot of support and coordination from the United States. But so far, I think it's fair to say they performed well. I think we also learned that the Iranians were not looking to conduct some kind of, you know, crippling blow, some kind of, you know, decisive strike on uh, on Israel. I think they were looking for a more moderate response. And then I think, too, uh, we learned a couple of things about, you know, this whole notion of Iran as this con fairly weak conventional power that is making up for those conventional deficiencies with uh, strategic missile capabilities and drone capabilities, right? The Iranians have put a lot of their research and development and their time and money into those capabilities, as opposed to 
you know, uh, more traditional air, land, and sea capabilities, right? The Iranian Air Force is very antiquated and old. They're trying to fix that problem with uh, new uh, Su-35s from Russia. Uh, the Iranian Navy is very small. It can't really project power beyond the Persian Gulf. Uh, and then the Iranian Army, right, uh, last really conducted, you know, large-scale maneuver warfare back in the 80s. And they did perform very well when they basically right. stopped Saddam on the border. But that's kind of the nuance here with Iran. They have these conventional weaknesses. And so they try to get around them with proxy forces and arming some of these groups in the region and with their missile capabilities. OK, so here's an interesting thing. So the, you just did talked about and, and he detailed some of the conventional weakness of the Iranian regime. So. Here's an odd thing. So Jack Keane, who I just told you back and showed you back in January, was saying that we should go after Iran because there's this great growing threat to the United States. Well, uh, I guess about an hour and a half ago, he actually went on in and first of all, kind of makes your point and, and expands on it a little bit, but then comes to, well, kind of a puzzling conclusion. Iran has a very weak military. Air Force still flying U.S. Uh, airplanes from the 1970s, Navy, very small, not a lot of capability, land forces, poorly equipped, poorly trained, even though they have sufficient numbers. They resource their rocket and missile force. That is where they put their money. And look what happened. Mm. That failed them as well. This is why I've always maintained that we can take advantage of Iran's vulnerability here by conducting limited measured attacks against the IRGC and these yeah. capabilities to force them to shut down their proxies. The Biden administration has never done it because why? They fear a, quote, wider war, unquote. When Iran can't fight a wider war, that's the reality of it, Stuart. Okay, I'm just going to say the, the most obvious part out loud first. If they can't fight a wider war, why do I need to go in and launch a preemptive war against them because of a growing threat to me? Make that make sense to me, Mike. Yeah, I mean, that's a perfect example right there of the hypocrisy. It speaks for itself. Um, Iran is not a... Uh, massive threat to the region and to everybody if they're as weak as General Keene says. Then the other thing he's wrong about is the conclusion that he comes to there is uh, sample size is the first thing I'd point to. Again, you're talking about, um, you know, a uh, uh, quarter of a of a single percent or or whatever, right, of, of, of Iran's total arsenal, uh, strategic arsenal. And you just can't draw those kinds of conclusions that, well, so now these capabilities have failed ipso facto, we can do whatever we want. It doesn't work that way. The other issue I'd point out here is that, um, right, you can't have it both ways. And we see the same issue with Russia. Uh, on one, In one sentence, they'll tell you that they're a paper tiger and they're a joke and they've failed. And then the other sentence, they'll tell you they're going to go in and take Poland and Germany and uh, the UK right. you know, in a matter of days, right? So again, it, people have to learn to see through the very cynical, uh, I would say, you know, uh, frankly, dishonest messaging uh, from General Keene there, and that's disappointing to see. But again, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? Iran is either this, you know, burgeoning superpower or they're a joke, right? And so you, you got to pick one or the other. And so I and think it was even worse because it's not just their conventional stuff, but then he also poo pooed on their, their uh, missile force. And again, if it's not that big of a threat, then why does Iran need any help from the United States? Right. And that's a great point, Danny. And, and the other thing I'd say too is, you know, you can poo poo the, the, the missile force. You, you have a better you have better credibility in doing that if the uh, intent for Iran was to de was to destroy Israel entirely with the strike. That was not the military or planning intention by Iran. And so that's the other issue with that argument is you can't say they failed if you're assessing it by a completely different uh, objective. If you're if you're if you're assessing it by a completely different standard. If Iran's goal was to test this magazine depth and test the radar saturation and send a mostly, you know, a symbolic signal to Israel, then you can't really argue that, you know, they failed in that regard. If Again, that's how Iran was seeing the, the, the goal. And we've seen a number of reporting, uh, you know, reports come out over the past couple of, of hours that indicate that that's sort of what Iran was looking to do here. So again, you know, he's judging it in the wrong way. If Iran attempted some kind of all out attack on Israel with no holds barred, no conditions, which is, again, not what we saw, maybe you could draw that conclusion. But again, that's just not what happened.
And and I know this isn't exactly an, an intelligence issue here, but one of the other things that's kind of under a theme between what he said, uh, what Pompeo said, and what somebody I'm going to reserve for just a few minutes is going to say also, and that is upon what basis can you take out Iran? I mean, they're talking about launching lethal military operations against a country that has not attacked us. And according to the U.S. Constitution, the 1973 War Powers Act, and the Geneva Conventions and all the UN conventions, you cannot just go and blow somebody up because you don't like them. And it's it's troubling to me just as an American and the values that we claim to want to uphold and this, Rock, you said, the rules-based uh, international order and all this and right doesn't make right or might doesn't make right. We can't then personify the exact opposite of that. There is no basis for doing what he's asking. Yeah, absolutely. And again, that's the bigger thing here. You know, we could talk about sort of the military analysis all day, and I think it's really important to do that. But the bigger point here has to be, you know, we have now seen uh, 20 years worth of evidence in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Afghanistan, that we cannot force liberal democracy at the end of a gun. OK, Iran is a nation of 90 million people. Enough of the people in that country have to overcome what many sociologists and political scientists have called the collective action problem. Right. The, the cost benefit analysis of organic political change, that calculation has to get to a point where change can happen. And that's how it has to work if it's going to last and if it's going to be meaningful. This idea that the United States should be using its military to go around the world uh, and depose every single tin pot dictator that we find and uh, bog ourselves down there to the tune of trillions of dollars to thousands of American lives with no no real goal or or purpose where we are squandering our national resources uh, and our bandwidth that need to be directed on far more pressing issues is just not really in America's interest. And that's, again, the biggest point that I would make here is that, uh, you know, this idea that you can, uh, you know, send a couple of, uh, you know, American stealth bombers, uh, you know, over the border and uh, kill all the Ayatollahs in some kind of cinematic cutscene, And then, you know, some young woman stands up in a pantsuit and goes, you know, I'm ready to be the president of Iran now. I mean, um, life is not a Marvel movie, Danny. I mean, life is yeah. not is not Harry Potter. So as somebody yeah. that has spent a lot of time in the region and has worked on uh, these issues as an intelligence officer, I can just tell you, you know, the idea that something like that is possible, I think, is what is in the heads of a lot of people like John Bolton and Mike Pompeo. And even a lot of the, you know, the, the, the Persian diaspora elsewhere that is very against the regime. Again. I'm against the regime too, but it just doesn't work that way where there's going to be some sort of perfect cutscene ending and there's going to be, you know, overnight some kind of new regime in Iran. We have yeah. learned that the world just doesn't work that way. And, and, and since you brought him up, uh, John Bolton, the mustachioed one, uh, I want to play a couple of clips that, that he has said too. And, and I want you to address that, that very issue about the reality. If, if the president were to somehow listen to him and did what he's suggesting here, especially in the second clip I'll show, what would happen? That's what I want to get your thoughts on, especially about, because no one ever talks about then what. And so let's talk about then what. First of all, here's what he said uh, yesterday about this situation. In today's world, the Gulf Arab states view the United States as weak and feckless. Iran now faces a potential Israeli strike in response to what happened last night. I think it's imperative that Israel strike decisively, not proportionately, disproportionately, to reestablish deterrence and to convince the terrorist proxies that Iran has set up in its ring of fire strategy that they're not intimidated. Okay, as, as we said a few minutes ago, the only reason this thing existed, this attack came from Iran, was because of the attack on the embassy by Israel. So if you're talking about deterrence, returning deterrence, then stop attacking. That That's a good point here. But here's the biggest issue here. When when Bolton says they should strike, uh, you know, above what happened, not, not an equivalent, but above, here's what he means. The last number I heard was 300 plus drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles, and maybe three or four got through. So who's the fool in this posture right now? Who looks weak? The regime in Iran looks weak. And a way to pin that down is for Israel to go after Iran's nuclear weapons program, which I think it can destroy or disable in very substantial part 
if not totally. Okay, so you've already addressed the, the, his, his part about who looks like the fool now. It's the guy with the mustache. Uh, but what if Biden did that? What if Biden says, you know what? We're going to give a green light to uh, Israel. We'll even help take out those nuclear facilities. Then you have your your ending credits and the, and the happy ending happens, right? Isn't that how it would happen? Right, exactly, Danny, exactly, right? There's no n- nothing further to discuss. And I think that's what's very dishonest about how uh, John Bolton and others frame this issue. They never really... Uh, tell you the next step. I'll at least give John Bolton credit for being honest that he wants to see the United States uh, go to war with Iran and bomb their nuclear sites and all of their strategic critical infrastructure. He'll at least say that with his chest. So I give him a little bit of credit. I think far more perniciously, you have a lot of folks in DC that will say, you know, we have to stand up to Iran. And then when it comes time to saying, okay, so you want to send American boys and girls into Bandar Abbas, and, and you want to have the Marines go ahead and storm the beaches, they get a little uncomfortable with that because they know how unpopular it is and they know how totally unnecessary it is. And so they kind of back down. So I give Bolton a little bit of credit for at least saying it, uh, saying it. But, but here's the thing. Let's actually game it out, which is another thing that even the John Bolton types don't do. First of all, what Bolton is telling you is, is in direct contravention to the entire sum total wisdom of our nation's uh, intelligence community, which knows and has said in, again, in declassified reports and in in other places, that there is absolutely no certainty that a strike from the West could destroy and disable Iran's entire uh, nuclear capabilities in one go. And that's what you'd have to do in a scenario like Bolton is talking about to have any kind of credibility, right? If you don't get all of those targets, and you don't get them completely, which again, many of these facilities are built under mountains. They are un- they're underground. I mean, we're, you know, bunker busters and things like that. You're, you're not even close to what you would need to penetrate some of these facilities. And so the idea that we could get them all uh, is just not accurate. And again, I, I, don't, I don't think people like Bolton actually understand the logistics of like a long range uh, strike package and what the capabilities are, what the limitations are regarding you know, air to air refueling and what the payloads really can be, especially if you're if you're going up to these heavier payloads, you know, you can carry less munition, right? So uh, that limits you, right? And then many of these facilities are in central Iran. They are thousands of kilometers away from anything, really. So they're very hard targets. Even if you hit them, you have no guarantee that you've hit all of them. And then all you've done at that point is justify Iran's case perfectly right. for exactly not just right. having a nuclear program, but developing an aggressive nuclear weapons program and maybe even using those nuclear weapons. So you've kind of completed, you know, sort of the, the fallacy, if you will, right, for on, on, on the Iran side. So they're able to say, OK, right, that this is what we need to do. Um, and the other thing I'd point out is, you know, there are uh, there are a number of issues with the idea that you could do regime change in a similar fashion, right? To the issue I pointed out earlier, you have the issue of loose nukes, you have the issue of warring factions, even in relatively homogenous countries, if you know your history, you've seen that when foreign imposed regime change happens, all of a sudden, all of the resources there are up for grabs. And various different- (laughs) Can you you say Libya out loud? Right, Libya is a great example. example. To this day, they're still divided after taking- Exactly, they're they're still fighting a civil war in Libya. And again, we heard the same routine, that Muammar Gaddafi is uniquely evil and he's Hitler and there's nothing worse than him. And I would say that open air slave markets in Libya are probably a little bit worse than what we saw under Gaddafi, who, again, let's not forget as well, Danny, surrendered his nuclear program and his nuclear weapons to the United States. So, again, this lesson, you know, Kim Jong-un learned that lesson as well. Like, well, so you need to have nukes. Again, it's hard to fault the Iranians for arriving at some of these same conclusions when this is just the nature of geopolitics, right? There is no supranational authority, right? As much as people try to allude to international law and international order, the state is still the core unit of power in the world and that, and everybody knows it. And so look, Iran is going to try to, uh, you know, uh, pursue, I think, a reasonable posture regarding like a, a, you know, what they think they need. But again, if we push that over the edge by attacking yeah. these facilities, it's a done deal, and there's now, and nobody can provide you a guarantee yeah. that we could do it. And, and in fact, on the can we can do it part. Let, let me ask one other question here. Uh, on the on the 
uh, defensive side from the Iranians. And we talked about their missile capability. What about their air defense capacity here? So if, if Israel wanted to try and do that, if they, even if it wasn't to take out the nuclear weapon, but if they wanted to launch an, an, an air strike uh, into Israel, uh, Iran proper, what what situation would they face? Would they be able to knock out all their air defense systems or do, would, uh, would they run into some problems of losing jets perhaps? Yeah, so the Iranians have an, an integrated air defense network, uh, like most major countries do. Uh, it's not an it's not an excellent air defense system, uh, as far as most uh, you know great powers are concerned. You know, as you might recall, they had that incident where they uh, shot down one of their own airliners when they closed airspace uh, during all of the dust up after the Soleimani strike and everything. So their air defenses aren't great, but again, what Iran relies on is a good enough air defense combined with time and distance. Iran is a massive country. It's one of the largest countries in the world by surface area. And they've put all these targets, um, you know, in very remote uh, parts of the country that are hard to access. So that gives them plenty of time as well to scramble jets and to make up for some of the deficiencies that you might have with an air defense network, not being up to like maybe a NATO standard when you give yourself more time and distance. So the Iranians have that in their favor in that regard. But then the bigger point is, if we look fairly objectively just on the capabilities, Israel, without the help of the United States, does not have a very robust long-range strike capability. They only have about five or six um, tankers that are really in active duty. And these are old uh, 707s, these these old, you know, kind of the, the, the precursor to uh, the KC-135s, the more modern tankers that you see. So they'd be relying on uh, a pretty antiquated, uh, more limited fleet of tankers to try to escort their fighters sort of as far as they can go. And again, if you look at the range profiles on, you know, your F F-16s, your F-15s, even with, you know, conformal fuel tanks and, and extra fuel, uh, it's it's tough. It's tough for the Israelis to get all the way there. Without how, the help how vulnerable the are the tankers to uh, Iranian uh, interdiction? Sorry? How, how vulnerable are those tankers to Iranian interdiction? I mean, in other words, could they, that's like the, the long pole in the tent. Could they take out those tankers? Yeah, they could. And again, you know, the Iranians would see that coming uh, from a mile away, right? It's very hard to uh, sort of hide your hand when you're assembling a long range strike package and you've got to put a ton of air assets in the air. You've got to put all your tankers in the air. You've got to keep them in the air for hours. It's very easy for your adversary to pick up on that. So they have some issues on that side of it, which is why I think it's very important that the Israeli response may change depending on what Biden said yesterday, right? If they don't feel that American tankers, which are far more capable and uh, American jets, which are far more capable, would be able to provide, you know, assistance, air cover, all these other things, um, you know, that may change how they decide to go forward and they may do something more limited. I think so, uh, so given that's why Biden, when Biden said we are not going to uh, engage offensive operations, that probably really changed the dynamics there for Netanyahu. I think it did. And and what, you know, that remains to be seen, Danny, and, and you know, you and me and everybody else, we're going to find out here in the next, you know, hours and days what happens. But I think, you know, uh, just before we went live, there were some reports as well that, you know, maybe the Israelis are considering, um, you know, sort of a symbolic target in Tehran. You know that they might use uh, one of their uh, their own ballistic missiles uh, to hit. Uh, so that would you know that would still be an attack on Iran, but that would be far more limited uh, than going after you know these nuclear sites, which again would be difficult for the Israelis to do without our help, and uh, would would not again we can't guarantee you could hit them all, and you can't guarantee that Iran would not just triple down on expediting their efforts to uh, develop you know nuclear weapons even faster and even right. more robustly. And that's now, why that, 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 that circles us back around to where this this discussion started here. Could the U.S. win a war? And by that part of inherent in that is, uh, should the U.S. even fight a war? And, and part of my concern is here uh, that we're already ex, uh, as, creeping up into that very territory already. We're now engaged a lot more than we were before October 7th. Uh, and and I just wanted to show a few things up here, Gary. If you could throw that map up that we had uh, we had used for that shows a lot of what's been going on. Uh, look, you, you have the one in the upper left hand corner there. That's all of our troops in Iraq and Syria, and all these different places where we've been attacked. And that's the number 
actually there's there's a lot more of that since then this is an older map but those are the locations uh to where we've taken fire from a lot of places as a result of israel going primarily as a result of israel going into gaza strip and killing two you know large numbers of civilian people that's all a lot of that was done in direct response to that then of course you have in the lower map there uh the the red sea and the yemen attacks from the houthis uh and now then we're having to engage in all that uh, so that was the case there. That's what we've done up to this point. Now, in the upper right-hand corner, that's the, the attack trajectory that was used by a lot of these uh, assets from Tehran. And as John Kirby said earlier today, we had some engagement there as well. American leadership was absolutely vital to helping Israel defend itself. We had American fighter pilots in the air, first time ever, uh, that we were involved in the active defense of Israel uh, in a combat sort of scenario. That's how seriously we take our commitments. And as the Israelis have said themselves, they couldn't have done what they did without American help. Yeah, everybody's hearing that. And so now they were physically engaged in shooting down air assets from another country. So that's just one more step where U.S. assets and U.S. military are already engaged here. And I, I think that it's absolutely vital that we not keep going down that path there. And, and Mike, as you and I have talked about before, all those troops in those locations we just showed there in the Middle East uh, are nothing but points of strategic vulnerability, and we should get them out of there so that they're no longer a threat to be attacked by Iran. Right. And, and I would refer, you know, folks back to some of our previous episodes on this, Danny. It's a lot to sort of cover the whole history of our presence in Iraq and Syria here. But I'll, I'll just briefly remind folks that, you know, as someone that was involved with it, with the counter ISIS uh, mission myself, uh, our presence in northeast Syria is, is no longer necessary for U.S. national security. It's just not. We can close those bases tomorrow and, and get those men and women out of there who are frankly just sitting ducks and leverage for Iran to continue attacking us via their proxies and in some cases directly. So I think the point that I that I want to make here, Danny, is that, you know, if, if we're looking at why, uh, you know, sort of I, I don't I don't want to do a, you know, victory lap in, in sort of patting ourselves on the back. But I do want to say this. You and I and a few other people have been warning since October 7th that we could find ourselves in a place where Iran and Israel are trading blows directly and the United States is, you know, uh, attacking Iran or whatever. And it is very important, like you just noted, to take a second and realize we are here. We didn't, you know, a lot of people didn't think, uh, the, oh, you know, oh, it's OK. You know, we can manage escalation, whatever. We're not going to get to this point. At every single point over the last six months, we have slowly been raising and raising and raising the boil on the kettle. And that's where I think to the people that are skeptical of further escalation risk, I would just say, how do you account for the last six months and everything yeah. that's happened to this point? There are people that said there's no way we get to a point where Israel and Iran are at war. And we are now essentially at that point right now. And yeah. so- it is important to take a moment and pat ourselves on the back, I think, for trying to warn that that could be where we go. And now that we're here, it's another good juncture to stop and say, OK, if we don't want this to go any further, we have to be the superpower. We have to be the hegemon looking out for what's best for the world and tell everybody here to knock it off. This, this doesn't help Israel. It doesn't help Iran. It doesn't help the United States to have a a global conflagration uh, start in the Middle East right now. Now, let, let me ask you this. In, in, the, in the last few minutes we have here, uh, if if Iran even, I'm sorry, if Israel even does the the lower level thing that you're talking about there and has a symbolic strike of, of a of a ballistic missile of some sort that goes into Tehran and hits anything and, and, and kills anybody on the ground, uh, the chances that Iran doesn't respond to that, I think, are non-existent. I think that they're going to do something. If that then that back and forth can, continues on until finally it blows up somewhere, uh, then you have the real possibility that Iran could uh, start pulling out more of its uh, weapons, uh, its, uh, its missile and drone fleets in much more uh, uh, dangerous ways. And then this is what I want you to talk about here specifically. At some point, uh, Hezbollah could join into this as well, and it could be a coordinated issue. And a lot of these so-called 150,000 or alleged 150,000 rockets of various types that they have, even if they're not that good, 
that will overwhelm anything that the Iron Dome system has. And Israel could then find itself almost without air cover if a, if a concerted attack is made from Hezbollah and Iran. Talk about the risk of that and, and the likelihood of that under any circumstances. Yeah, that's a good point, Danny, that, you know, as as sort of dramatically uh, sort of uh, bad things have gone over the past 48 hours, uh, it is important to remind people there are still several more steps up this escalation ladder uh, where things could get much worse. And I don't say that to uh, fear monger or anything. I think it's important that we lay out these scenarios for people uh, as you know, as as former uh, uh, intel folks, former military folks that know these things, right? And so, what I would say is, what you saw from Iran was a calibrated response. If Iran were to use a much more significant portion of its medium-range ballistic missiles and its one-way attack drones and its cruise missiles, which again number in the thousands, the tens of thousands altogether, then you add that together with Hezbollah's arsenal which again, as you said, is in the hundreds of thousands, less capable systems, but still notable, uh, you know, tactical ballistic missiles and a number of other uh, systems as well. And then you add that to, you know, the, uh, uh, the cruise missile capabilities that the Houthis have. If there were some kind of coordinated all-in-one attack that was really designed to go all out, yes, it would be a huge issue for Israel, even with the help of the United States and Jordan and others, to, to counter that. Uh, and, you know, the Israelis have more than just Iron Dome, right? They have uh, the Arrow system, Arrow 2 and Arrow 3. They have David Sling. They have a number of, of, of different, uh, you know, systems for different air defense threats. But again, it's all about ammunition here, uh, like we've, you know, talked about many times in, in Russia and Ukraine as well. And the Israelis would be, uh, yeah, they would be in, in big trouble when it comes to um, being able to provide ammunition uh, for all of those systems in the event of an all-out attack. And that's why we, there have to be limits here, right? The people that claim that there's just no risks to Israel or no risks to the United States are wrong. And, I, and I've had this wrong. Just, yeah, just practically with, fundamentally wrong. Yeah, with, with many risks. of my Israeli friends that, look, uh, you know, I, Israel, of course, uh, is, you know, had to respond to October 7th. They, they're they probably going to respond to uh, the attacks on their territory. Uh, that we saw yesterday. I totally understand that. But we have to be rational in understanding that if we go too many more steps up this ladder, again, we're already way up there. Uh, it could There could be devastating scenarios for Israel, for America, for the region, right? So I, I don't want to see that yeah. happen. Right. And and I'll tell you what worries me. So the uh, last, last, last few minutes we got here, I'm going to show you a couple of, of scene or uh, uh, clips, one from Biden, one from Netanyahu, and this is why I'm worried that those wrongs may be uh, played. Yeah, Gary, if you can first throw the one by Biden up there. Mr. President, Mr. President are, are American President. troops at risk as well? We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel, and Iran will not succeed. Thank you very much. What would trigger a direct U.S. response, sir? And then you have Netanyahu, who has already many times over the last six months uh, taken ben, uh, uh, Biden's threats or warnings or in, uh, requests and just thrown them into the trash. Here's what he said uh, just before all this stuff uh, came across from Iran. <laughs> שלא נפסקים כדי להחזיר את חטופינו, אבל אנחנו נערכים גם לתרחישים של אתגרים מזירות אחרות, ואנחנו קבענו עיקרון פשוט. מי שפוגע בנו, אנחנו פוגעים בו. אנחנו נערכים לענות על הצרכים הביטחוניים של מדינת ישראל, גם בהגנה וגם בהתקפה. He specified, if you harm us, we'll harm you, and he specified offensive. Well, they just got hit with all this stuff, so that gives him all the cover any way he needs to do something. And I worry that he is going to do something uh, as opposed to just, quote, taking the win as Biden correctly and wisely asked him to do. But I fear that those wrongs are looking pretty perilous right now. Yeah, I think if you're familiar with uh, Israeli politics, if you're familiar with Bibi's career, right, I mean, it's no secret that 
Uh, he has uh, wanted to uh, go after these nuclear sites in Iran for a long time, and he may have sort of the perfect pretext to do that right now. And again, that's where it is the role of the United States to uh, step in here. I saw a report yesterday as well from an unnamed uh, administration official that said, well, you know, what Israel does is for them to decide. Uh, I'm sorry, when the United States is the uh, global superpower that provides military intelligence and financial support to Israel and has 30,000 American boys and girls right. in the region, you better believe that we get a say in what happens. Well said. You value the relationship and the alliance, right? You should be able to have difficult conversations with your closest friends. You should be able to t sit them down and tell them, this is getting out of hand. This is going too far. Out yeah. of love, out of love for them and out of respect, right? And that's what I think we need to be doing right now with our Israeli brothers and sisters. We have to be explaining to them that if this goes too much further, especially with the United States now signaling that there are actually some red lines here, yeah, it could be very dangerous. It could be very dangerous for everybody, and I don't want to see that. And so I think the yeah. responsible thing to do right now is for the Israelis to take the win. The, the air defense systems performed beautifully. Iran, uh, as far as causing any damage, which again, I think it's debatable how much damage they were looking to cause, but as far as causing any damage, they did not succeed yeah. in doing that. I think you take the win and you get off of this escalation cycle so that we can kind of reset tensions in the region right now. And because here's my, my, my biggest worry is that based on, you know, Biden always saying like he did, we are ironclad support. We have your back defense of Israel, et cetera, that if Israel doesn't listen to that advice and they do anything at all, which spawns a, a, a painful strike back from uh, Iran, then there's going to be overwhelming bipartisan political pressure on Biden to say, make good on that threat. And, and, that people won't be paying attention to any of the logic that you've talked about in this whole show right here. It'll all be emotion. And then we're going to, we're going to leap to that last rung. That's, that's the biggest worry that I have. Yeah. And I, and I, and look, I think if you are familiar with um, how ugly war can get, uh, you have to be thinking that way. You have to be thinking tragically. You have to be thinking uh, with your, uh, with, with your clearest possible head. You can't, fall into sort of the emotionality of all this. And we have to, to bring ourselves back from the brink here, Danny. I, I don't want to see uh, additional uh, a, a additional things spiral out of control in the region. And I think your fears, as much as it, uh, it you know it pains me to say, I think are valid. And I think, again, that's where it's the responsibility for the U.S. to uh, try to de-escalate the situation right now. Well, let's let's hope that that happens. Let's hope and pray that saner heads can prevail. I mean, we we're right up to the last, but uh, it's it hasn't happened, so it is still possible to avoid that to to ramp things down. And certainly, there's some history of that happening as well. And let's hope that uh, that that happens here. But we thank you so much for coming on today, Mike. As always, a brilliant uh, layout of of all, all the things that are at stake here, and we now know a lot more about what's at stake than we did before. Thank you for that. You got it, Danny. And we thank you guys for joining us too. As always, we're unintimidated and uncompromised, even given you the issues of war and peace and how close we may be to some bad decisions. But now you too know the truth and uh, ask you to join us again tomorrow, folks. Uh, we're going to have Ambassador Freeman, uh, who is going to have some more insights on the diplomatic level of this stuff. You are not going to want to miss that. That's uh, again, giving you some insight that you're just not going to get uh, along in mainstream media. So we're going to provide that for you. We also are going to have a, a terrific show tomorrow uh, by Alex of History Lessons Legends. Um, he's going to show us uh, the progression of the, the Russian tactical operations from the beginning in February 2022 through the current evolutions that have gone on now. It's an absolutely fascinating analysis. You're not going to want to miss that either. Those are both shows on tomorrow. Uh, just check our listings there so you can see what time it starts in your area. And we will see you on Daniel Davis Deep Dive.